Colossians 2 verses 6 to 10. The word should be behind me as well. Alive in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Fantastic. Please do take a seat. It's great to be here. We're continuing our series going through um, Colossians. And we live with levels of danger and risk that we just get used to. You know, we just get used to. So last year in the UK, 1,633 people died in road traffic accidents. 1,633 people. That's roughly 31 people every week died in a road traffic accident. For comparison, the UK National Lottery makes seven new millionaires every week. So if you buy a lottery ticket, you are four times more likely to be killed in and around a car than win a significant prize. (laughs) And I'm telling you, exactly, exactly. So don't don't, don't get a National Lottery ticket unless you think that you're just giving to charity. We live with levels of danger that we're just not aware of or alert to. Of course we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to function. You know, we'd never be able to step off the pavement into the road to cross the road and buy milk at the local Tesco. A few months ago, uh, Rachel and I, we were driving happily down the motorway, looking forward to uh, a conference that we were going to with other church leaders, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a car sped past us on the inside lane. It must have been doing about like 90 miles an hour, and hit the side of our car as it tried to undertake. And all at once, kind of like the danger of driving was right in front of us, right there. We were all fine, no one was hurt, but the shock took several hours before we got our heads back in the game. Paul, in this section of his letter to the followers of Jesus in Colossae, he's wanting to alert the Colossians to the very real spiritual danger, the risk of spiritual car crash that they face in that city. See to it that no one takes you captive, he says. Yes, following Jesus, he's told them, is an astonishing privilege. Knowing God as a father, sharing in the loving family of God's holy people, being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, assurance that your sins and mistakes and brokenness are all forgiven by King Jesus. And this wonderful blessing is contested. It's contested. It is fought over. There are spiritual forces that want to take these blessings away from God's people, away from us. There's an enemy, the Satan, who, spiritually speaking, would love to see you in a mess at the side of the motorway rather than safe and alive in Christ. Spiritual danger. Before we think about spiritual danger, public life in London, and and we love London, we love this city, public life in London is mostly secular. And public life in this city operates from the assumption Not just that there is no such thing as spiritual danger, but that there is no spiritual aspect to life full stop. You know, any acknowledgement of anything spiritual, any acknowledgement of God in public life would be jarring and strange to many people. If our politicians started speaking about what was going on spiritually in the country, to most people that would sound like completely the wrong place to be talking about those things. Charles Taylor... Uh, is a philosopher and a sociologist and an expert on secularism and how it operates. And he says that what our culture has done is to get us to focus exclusively on what he calls the imminent frame. The imminent frame. Everything that's imminent, i.e. everything that is material, that's physical. We're concerned overwhelmingly with the material world, with physical pursuits, with what can be seen, with what can be experienced. And this just seems normal to us. This is what we call normal life. But Charles Taylor shows that Western culture has had to learn this way of existing. 
We've had to learn to live in a world which is completely physical and material. And so we've had to unlearn the alternative. So before secularism, and you have to go back quite a way, before secularism, so medieval Western people lived in a world which was, to use the word, enchanted. It was a world that was filled, that everyone knew it was filled with spiritual beings, with unseen spiritual activities and actions and consequences. It was a world in which human beings lived lives which had not just imminent significance. They didn't just make an impact on what was physical and immediate and concrete, but they made an impact and made a difference and their actions had consequences in a transcendent spiritual realm. Now, we struggle with this. We struggle with this because everything that our culture produces now tells a story of imminence. It tells a story of the immediate and the concrete. All that matters is what you can see and experience. And this world that our culture lives in, you know, to the rest, to lots of the world, it looks like a a disenchanted world which is a cold and a hard place. We have to sort everything out for ourselves. We have to find our own goals. We have to find our own meaning. You have to find your own answers to the big questions in life. Buying and selling is what life is all about. Even relationships are a transaction. People ask, what will I get from this? The world is kind of like a closed box. According to the religion of secularism, the world is like a closed box. And there's nothing in that box except empty space, physical concrete objects, and then human beings trying to find meaning in a closed, empty world. And then we come to the Bible. And we come to a completely different world. You know, our eyes are opened that the world might be completely different than our culture tells us. What if the world isn't a closed box, but actually open to the spiritual world for good or for evil? What if the world isn't empty? You know, what if this space isn't actually just empty space? What if every bit of space is spiritually occupied for good or for evil? What if in this open world you can can access what's going on spiritually? You can open yourself to receive positive spiritual power. What if in this supposedly empty world you could be filled up spiritually? You don't have to scrabble around making your own meaning, finding your own purpose, but you can just open yourself to be filled up and receive fullness of life. This is the world that Paul is inviting us into at the heart of this letter to the Colossians. This passage is at the heart and centre of Paul's writing to the following of Jesus in Colossae. And before we come to it, we just had to set the scene for kind of what the world is that we're living in because what Paul's inviting us into is so radically different from anything that our culture talks about. It's the heart of the letter to the Christians in Colossae. And it's concerned with two things, that passage that Izzy read. Two things. If you've got a Bible, you might want to open your Bible. If you need a Bible, there are some black Bibles at the back there. How to open yourself up to spiritual reality that's found in Jesus. And how to fight against the very real danger of the spiritual forces which want to take that away from you. So Paul writes... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Received Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul, he was a Jewish man entirely preoccupied with the religious concerns of his time. And then suddenly on the road to Damascus, his world was shattered by Jesus who appeared dramatically in front of him. Paul's world was turned upside down. Jesus spoke to him with life-changing words. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jordan explained last week, you know, that those words assume, why are you persecuting me? Paul hasn't been persecuting Jesus. He's been persecuting the church. So those words assume that Jesus is so intimately united with his church that whatever happens to the church happens to Jesus. We are his body. Followers of Jesus are united with Jesus in a way which is so intimate 
that whatever happens to Jesus happens to us. Whatever happens to us happens to Jesus. We are, as Paul will say 143 times in his letters, in Christ, in the Messiah, in the Messiah, inside the Messiah. As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, inside him, in the Messiah. But what does it mean to receive the Messiah, to receive Christ? Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. Does it mean that we believe he is who he says he is? Does it mean we start to follow him, reading his teaching and his life in the Bible to make our lives like him? Does it mean we accept his authority in all our big life decisions? Yes to all of that, absolutely, completely, and yet there's more. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. We're in Christ, in the Messiah, and, and, we can actually receive, think about this, pause for a moment, that don't just skip past this because you've read it so often. We can actually receive the person of Jesus Christ himself into, into who I am. You know, that you can actually receive spiritually, you can receive the actual person of Jesus Christ into who you are. You know, Paul has mentioned this earlier in the letter to the Colossians, in the same letter. He talks about the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Receive Christ Jesus. It's personal and it's intimate. And yes, and, and we receive him as Christ Jesus, the Lord, the Lord. Paul emphasizes continually that we receive Jesus as Lord. In his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, he says, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Philippians chapter 2, let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord means master, Lord, sovereign. Uh, in the first century, though, it was the word that was used when you were reading the Bible instead of the name of God. So the name of God in the Old Testament is Yahweh, and because that name was regarded as so holy and so precious, and people wanted to be so careful not to misuse it, it was replaced by Lord, Adonai in Hebrew, Kurios in Greek. And what does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? What does that mean? Well, we don't have to guess. We don't have to look that word up in English so that we might get it a little bit wrong. Because Paul has told us in this letter to the Colossian Christians, Jesus is Lord means that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You want to see God? You look at Jesus. He's the firstborn over all creation, the most significant person over the whole of creation. He's the head of the body, the church. He's in charge of his church. I'm not in charge of this church. Jesus is. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is saying, make this your spiritual reality. You know, walk in the Messiah. Receive Jesus, the Lord, into yourself. Wherever you go, whatever you do, receive the Messiah. Take him into you, into every situation in your life. In everything that you do, he's given himself totally, totally for you. As you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. I love this. I love this. Walk in him. In him means that everything around you, everything around you is Jesus. Yeah? You're in him. Everything around you is Jesus. And you've received Jesus into yourself. So everything inside you is Jesus. Everything around you is Jesus. Everything inside you is Jesus. Christians are drenched in Jesus. This is the spiritual world that we're living in. This is the spiritual world we've opted for when we started following Jesus. It's amazing. Drenched in Jesus, flooded in Jesus, everywhere, Jesus. And Paul goes on, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So rooted and built up. So with deep roots going deep down into Jesus, fed and sustained in him. 
and built up the images of a house built on the foundation of Jesus. Your deep roots will have something to show for what they're receiving from the Messiah. You know, it won't just be deep roots with nothing to show you. They will be rooted deep and built up with a strong and a permanent and a welcoming household. This is the spiritual reality that you're invited into by Jesus when he says, follow me. In our secular culture, there's so much that is great about our culture. Love this city. Love it, love it, love it. But you will never see this spiritual reality reflected back to you. Never. You will never see a sympathetic character anywhere on Netflix or Apple TV or whatever. You will never see the person or the group of people, much more realistic, who are living with Christ surrounding them, Christ inside them, roots deep in the reality of Jesus and the evidence of this built up into a life that gives glory to God. You will never see that reflected back to you from the culture. We can only expect to make that happen and to see that happen in our church family. In the first century too, the church in Colossae didn't ever see that reality in the wider Roman culture. So Paul says, see to it. Don't forget that you need to walk in him, walk in the Messiah, be rooted and built up and established in him, in him. This is the completely different take on what constitutes reality. This is the reality that we're living out of. This is the reality. This is the reality that we're living in as followers of Jesus. We live in a totally different story. Are you with me? Good. So there we are, cruising down the motorway of real life with Jesus. Uh, We're in him, so he's the car. We've received him, so he's the driver, he's the road, he's the destination, everywhere Jesus. And there are dangerous spiritual forces that want to force you off the road. So Paul warns, see to it that no one takes you captive. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Taken captive. This is, this is war talk. It's the language of war. It's the language of taking hostages like we saw in the Gaza-Israel conflict at the beginning. As we've seen in Nigeria and Eritrea and Ukraine, taking prisoners is a basic tactic of war. It stops people from playing their part on the one side and gives you bargaining power and influence over those who remain. Taking captives, taking prisoners... This is what the elemental spirits of the world are trying to do. They're trying to take you out of the battle. And how are they doing this? They're doing this with philosophy and empty deceit. In other words, you know, vain and empty ideas about the way the world is. This is a battle of ideas. The elemental spirits of the world are demonic forces trying to captivate you with a different worldview than the real created cosmos, which the Bible says is the world which actually exists. That's what they're trying to do. In 390-something, so a long time ago, uh, a man called Evagrius of Pontus, he wrote an amazing book called Talking Back, a monastic handbook for combating demons. I have it here. If anyone wants a monastic handbook for combating demons, you can take down the details uh, later. And he explains that the fight against demons is a fight against thought patterns. It's a fight against ideas. It's a fight against your internal beliefs and the internal narratives and stories that you tell yourself. And where do you get those stories from? They're the thoughts and the beliefs and the narratives which you encounter through the systems and narratives of the surrounding culture. Beliefs and narratives with the malignant, dark, demonic forces of evil behind them. So Evagrius of Pontus, he's, he's amazing. He just, like, he, just, he just identifies, like long before philosophy or psychology sort of does it in the West, he just identifies like all of these ways in which those thoughts control the aspirations that we have for our lives and the ways that we limit and constrain ourselves and take ourselves out of the fight. John Mark Comer puts it like this. He says, he's an American pastor, he puts it like this. He says, our fight with the devil is first and foremost a fight to take back control of our minds 
from their captivity to lies and liberate them with the weapon of the truth. Or as Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Evagrius of Pontus, he says that the way that we fight against demonic false narratives of the elemental spirits of the world is by turning our minds to the truth of scripture. And his book is basically a list of scripture quotations to use against everything that the world might throw at you. You know, he's got Bible quotes to use against the demon of anger, Bible quotes to use against the demon of pride, against the demons of greed and gluttony, against the demons of sexual sin, against the demons of love, of money. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And so, and so we come to the battle with the truth of Christ in the words of the Bible, and we bring those words against the deceptive ideas that the world tries to seduce us with. See to it, says Paul, that you're not taken captive. And this is what he does. He, this is exactly what Paul does here too. He says what we need to do is to put the truth in front of us. The truth about the way that the world is, we need to put that in front of us. And this is what he does. He says, in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. In other words, if you want to see what God looks like, open the Gospels, open the Bible at the life of Jesus, because in him, all the fullness of God's nature, all the fullness of God's character dwells in human form. So we have a spiritual practice here at Christchurch Spitalfields. Every day, Bible before phone. Every morning, every morning, the first words I read are from Scripture. And I try and listen to the Bible at various points throughout the day. I try and get through the Bible uh, at least once a year, if not more. You know, listening to it on my way to the tube, in the gym, walking to meetings. And I've kind of, you know, this isn't just a nice spiritual, spiritual thing to do. It's an essential way of making sure that I'm walking in the Messiah that I'm not being taken prisoner by everything that the world might throw at me. And finally, if the band would like to come up, finally, when it comes to a standoff between demons, the demons that Evagrius of Pontus talks about, the elemental spirits of anger, sexual sin, greed, desire to have more stuff, when it comes to a standoff between all of those demons and Jesus, Jesus will always win. Jesus will always win. Paul reminds the Colossians, he says, you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he ascends to heaven and sits on the throne of heaven next to God the Father. So if you want not to be taken prisoner by the lies of our culture, if you want not to be taken prisoner by the marketing and the conspiracy theories and the addictive technology content and the politics of this current age, if you want to keep your freedom in Christ, Jesus can guarantee that for you. The narrative from our culture is that we lived in a closed, spiritually empty universe. And Paul wants us to press into something very different. He doesn't want us to be seduced, to be taken prisoner, but he wants us to be deeply rooted, built up and established in faithfulness to Jesus as Lord. And that's what I would love to see more and more of for our church this morning. That's what I'd love us to see. I'd love to see more of us living our whole lives in that reality the reality of being surrounded by Christ and being filled with Christ and being spiritually filled with everything that Jesus wants to give us by being poured into who we are. My fear is that some of us, maybe not all the time, but some of us are being taken prisoner. And if that's you, I want you to be set free today. You know, some of us, we are listening to lies and we're listening to the wrong stories and we're constraining ourselves and we're limiting what God wants to do in and through us. 
And Jesus today wants to speak the truth to you about how much he loves you, how much he wants to fill you up with his love and joy and peace and out of that place for you to have impact on the world. And some of us, you know, we're living in that secular world, the world that the secular space describes back to us, empty, lonely, anxious. And today Jesus wants to say, receive me. You know, be filled up with me. Let me fill you up with the love and the hope and the glory of Christ. Right down deep inside who you are. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith. Just as you were taught. Abounding in thanksgiving. Would you like to stand as you're able?